extremely excited to introduce our first panel. It's not only the first, it's also layer one. So, what are we going to do today? We are going to have the layer one superpower consensus and execution at scale. Moderator of the panel, it's David Johnston. David is a freedom maximalist coming into us from Dallas right now. And not only on blockchain, so if you want to take AI, talk AI, the bubble, the right space for you. And he has another interesting quality. He is a very passionate father of many, many kids, even more than I have. So if you want to talk about fatherly advice, that's the man for you as well. With that, I would love to welcome David and his panel. We have John Woods, the CTO of Algorand. We have Lehman Baird, the co-founder of Hedera. And yes, thank you, I'm an investor. I appreciate it very much. But you have to hatch against Ethereum from time to time, right? So thank you very much. We have Yuval Roos, the co-founder and CEO of Digital Assets Holding. Emin Gur Sirio, the founder and CEO of Everlabs. Welcome, David, and his panel. Thank you very much. All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for showing up early after that amazing dinner last night. Well, I'm excited about this panel because, you know, layer ones are something I've been passionate about and involved with since the early days of 2013, 2014. And so, you know, just want to dive right in with the panel and, and start with the conversation about scaling superpowers, right? And what does that mean to you? You know, what have you seen the last year? And then we're going to get into the future. You'd like to kick us off? Sure. Uh, let me start by talking about how we see uh, scaling in, in, uh, you know, from an avalanche-centric lens. So um, if you look at what's happening, I think uh, there's a very simple way of interpreting history. We started out with Bitcoin, the mother of all coins, so to speak. And Bitcoin is, I'm not counting the ordinals, that's sort of a new development. At its core, Bitcoin is a single asset, single chain system. That was followed by Ethereum. That's a multi-asset, single-chain system. And now we're looking at uh, essentially third-generation coins. There are only a few of these, uh, Avalanche, Cosmos, and Polkadot. These are multi-asset, multi-chain systems. And uh, multi-chains give us an enormous advantage. You can have specific chains for different uses. Uh, load spikes on any one chain do not affect any other. Fees on chains are isolated. And you can have chains specialized for different regulatory compliance regimes. And so that's, I think, one of the big things that, uh, that has happened. Now, if I put my nerd hat on, there's also a lot of talk about protodank sharding, all these like, new invented terms. Uh, you know, when you don't know the existing literature, you tend to invent new terms. So there's a <laughs> lot of that stuff going on. But underneath it all, that's the, what, what multi-chains give you is essentially the same kind of sharding. They allow you to, they give you what we call functional sharding. Different functions are on different chains. Sure. And that allows you to get, uh, get uh, some uh, speed up. So in addition to this, there's a, there are a whole bunch of other things that chains have been doing. Um, so obviously Avalanche brought in the biggest uh, improvement in consensus protocols since uh, the Satoshi white paper. Uh, so that's a big step up. Uh, there's also parallelism to be extracted. The best parallelism, of course, is extracted by having multiple chains. But there's also micro parallelism that you can eke out a little bit if you work a little harder and you pay a little bit more cost. So that's how I see what's going on. And uh, there's going to be, of course, a whole bunch. We're going to talk about L2s. L2s are a completely different thing, <laughs> and uh, we have a lot of opinions on that. Uh, but that's sort of my te technologist view of what has happened. And, um, and we're approaching, in my view, some kind of closure. There aren't that many different architectures to try. So uh, this is what we got, and, um, and I think we have a workable architecture. Avalanche has demonstrated that we can have you know, millions of users in South Korea using one chain at the same time as games using another chain, at the same time as a whole bunch of people like me and everybody sure. else using the, uh, the C chain, the contract chain. Wonderful summary of, of sort of where we come from. Why don't we go right down the line, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. And to be honest, there's, there's, as I mean said, there's not much to add. I, I do agree that multi-chain, multi-asset is kind of the, the next evolution. I think uh, at Digital Asset, uh, we're, we're launching in, in May uh, a new L1. Mm -hmm. There's a connection to Switzerland. First of all, the team that developed it is here in, in Zurich, but also this idea of multi-chain. So Switzerland is the biggest federation of effectively independent cantons right. that know how to interact with other, uh, each other as an independent country. So the, the network that we're launching is called Canton. Um, cool. and, and this idea of multi-chains 
but that can still talk to one another seamlessly as if it's one country. So sure. again, kind of a similar analogy to the internet, you use one browser to connect to what you think is one network, right. but really under the hood is many networks that know how to give you, the user, a seamless experience. Maybe the one thing to add that really was our biggest challenge is uh, most smart contract chains today effectively have a privacy model that all the applications adhere to. Right. And we wanted to create a chain where the smart contract tells the chain, this is my privacy model, mm -hmm. and I want you to enforce this privacy model. And the reason is because we believe that all applications, again, back to the internet analogy, you can go to cnn.com, fully public uh, website, and then you go to chase.com, fully private website, right? right? And so this idea, how can you create an experience where you have different applications that provide a different privacy model, yep. but can still interact with one another uh, atomically. So I can actually take a fully private application and settle it with USDC without invalidating each other's privacy model. Mm, that's great. Women? Yeah, so I think we've seen a lot of uh, scaling recently. So we have Hedera's ABFT, this is asynchronous business default tolerance, so it's secure, and it's very fast. So we have you know, one user doing over 1,000 transactions a second. Mm -hmm. But then with this ABFT, this allows you to have sharding, which is like multiple chains, right. which can be overall ABFT if each of the individual ones are ABFT. And so you can get these security proofs, these mathematically provable security things. Uh, you know, we've had COQ, a computer program, check the security proofs. Right. But then it can scale and still have the security proofs for the scaling. And so this is important. So you can have state proofs and you can have sharding where it's guaranteed to be ABFT for the entire thing. I think this is where we're going. And then the next step beyond that, of course, is that the same mechanisms that work between the shards right. allow interledger communication between other blockchains that are unrelated sure. as well. And then if they are ABFT, the entire system of the two talking to each other can be ABFT. So I think this is where we're going with scaling, is that we have fast individual ledgers blockchains, and then you go to sharding where you have several talking to each other, but you still have the security guarantees, but then the next step beyond that is completely unrelated ledgers are talking to each other, and you still have the ABFT guarantees if the individuals were. Okay. So I think this is where we're going with scaling, and this is good because I think that we are seeing real-world usage now of ledgers. Like I said, one user is doing 1,000 a second, okay. and I think we're going to see that grow exponentially over the next few years. That's great. John? Now, as to why Algorand is the best. <laughs> um, you know, I, my, my thinking on it is that sharding and multi-chain, um, co-chains, whatever, are interesting. But they introduce, you know, um, problems. So they, they bring some solutions, but they introduce some problems. Notably, I think, in data availability and um, in finality. Our thesis at Algorand is that if you build a layer one that's fit for purpose, Mm -hmm. um, it can scale out to meet the requirement. And so that's what our focus is. Of course, Algorand leverages a novel consensus algorithm known as pure proof of stake. Um, it uses uh, verifiable random functions, which are essentially asymmetric HMAC functions, um, in order to have a compu computationally light um, consensus mechanism, which scales out to tens of thousands of transactions a second. And so Algorand right now is quite literally, with zero downtime, hitting uh, visa level uh, transaction flow, um, or sorry, capability. Um, and we think that we're on the right track, but uh, the great thing about software is if we've made a mistake, we can always just copy what Emmons doing. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Well, why don't we jump into the next subject, which is I really want to talk about the application of cutting edge tech, right, to, um, you know, bringing it into reality. And there's been a lot of that the last couple of years. You know, there's been so much sort of fundamental development that I think maybe people have not been privy to, you know, in, in the middle of the bear market, people aren't necessarily paying as much attention. So, you know, John, maybe you can kick us off with, you know, sort of some of the, the latest that uh, you're looking forward to sort of coming into fruition. Sure. I think if you look at the work we're doing at the foundation and at our uh, partners at, at Algorand Technologies who are engineering the protocol, it tends to be focused on reducing friction. Mm. I think that that's probably... Uh, the, the key idea. And so the most impactful work that we've done are, are, is things like we've, we've totally revolutionized the developer tool suite for, for Algorand. And this is important because essentially, of course, these blockchains are operating systems, right? They are just platforms that execute code. At the heart of most of them, there's a virtual machine. It runs bytecode. That bytecode is compiled contracts. But ultimately, it's a software CPU that's executing software 
Right. It's ex executing applications. And so we need to make it as easy as building an iPhone app, as building an app on Visual Studio Code, as building an app in, in Android Studio. Right. And so that's been our focus. It's giving that traditional software engineering experience of line-by-line -line debugging, static analysis, you know, the kind of guardrails uh, that keep you in a, in a happy and safe place as a developer right. to the Web3 developers. And I, I kind of hate that term, Web3. Um, so yeah, I think if you look at what we've done, it's, it's, it's been focused on reducing friction, and not just on the tech side. We have a community, a communities in DevRel team that are out there holding the hands of, of engineers that are, that are venturing into this space for the first time, you know, giving love and support to, to startups that, that, that choose to you know, uh, take a risk and, and build on, on blockchain platforms. And so I think reducing friction in, in every possible way should be you know, uh, the North Star. Yeah, I agree. That's, that's the key to mass adoption. Lehman, what's on your radar? I strongly agree. <laughs> If hey, we have an industry that is very powerful and the world hasn't yet seen everything it's doing, the only way to reach the other 99% of the world is for it to be easy to use, easy to develop on, smooth inter, um, experiences for the developers. And so we put a lot of effort into that, into making this easy to, to switch to it, easy to learn it, easy to build things. Right. And uh, this is critical. It has to be easy. Even things like if you lose your keys, how do you get them back? And you and I will talk about that later. Absolutely. Uh, but even that is... is making this easier for the mainstream to use. That's very important. Also, as we have scaled up, we've had to start looking at how do you manage huge amounts of data? Because, of course, if you're immutably storing everything forever and you have a 1,000 transactions a second or tens of thousands or whatever, yep. you have to be storing that and then be able to uh, access it quickly and all of that. And so there's a lot of infrastructure that is being built mm. right now to uh, handle all this usage that is coming. And so I would say those are things. And then in the future, of course, I've been talking about how we are working to do state proofs and other things that just um, make the sharding and other things work well. Yeah. So these are some of the things that uh, we're working on. But I think the real, the real main thing that we need to be doing is looking at how we reach the people that aren't yet using blockchain. And that is to make it easier for consumers, but also easier for uh, developers. And that's a, that's a very important thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, you know, just maybe to add in terms of the easy to use, we're targeting mainly enterprise type of clients, so mainly capital markets, insurance companies type of use cases. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, I was at, at Citadel when, when, when Python suddenly picked up, and Python has been around for many years. Right. And, and I remember really the, the reason why Python suddenly became so popular is because a bunch of quants just started building a lot of open source libraries that suddenly said, you shouldn't use MATLAB, you should just use Python, right? And there's much more powerful capabilities and you don't need to pay so much money mm. to use MATLAB. And, and the reason I bring up that example is um, when you look at capital markets applications or even uh, life insurance, which we're, we're doing uh, a very big project, they all end up being very similar to one another. The use case is different. Some of the life cycles are slightly different, but to be honest, if you look at a structure product, an equity structure product and a life insurance, it's the same product. One has a death uh, benefit and one has, you know, the, the option expires. Sure. So one of the things that we've invested quite a lot is building open source libraries right. of some of these building blocks of these applications. Again, kind of to make the developer experience easier, but also one of the things that I think a lot of people uh, don't appreciate is a bond is a bond, but if the zeros and ones are not the same, the computer doesn't think that these are the same thing. Yeah, maybe right. a human will say this is a bond and this is a bond, but when you start thinking about interoperability, if the data model is not the same, right. those things will not be able to, to be exchanged or worked with one another uh, easily. So a lot of investment into open source data models to allow you to build these applications. So it's not just faster to market, but it's also easier to interoperate uh, later on. That's great. So uh, for us, the big thing is Avalanche V2. And uh, Avalanche V2 has a lot of uh, new exciting features in it. And, um, and uh, so uh, the, the key, of course, uh, the key uh, component there is uh, e bigger improvements to the very core of the, uh, 
the, uh, the consensus protocol, the avalanche consensus protocol itself, to reduce the uh, acceptance times, the time to finality, from uh, what it is now, which is slightly below one second in practice, to even lower numbers. Mm. So, uh, if, if, if one could believe that. Um, so, uh, but I don't want to go too much down into the depths. I, I think at a very high level, if you look at what's happening again, at the meta level, um, until recently, people would come up on stage like this, and they would try to dazzle you with tech terminology, right? You heard of VDFs, verifiable delay functions. You heard of, uh, of uh, accumulators. You heard of every single fancy cryptographic gadget. John and Silvio, myself, you know, people who studied cryptography. Lehman, of course, is a, is a PhD uh, in uh, computer science. We could do this all day long. Okay? Like we could just, just dazzle you with terminology and, and stuff of that kind for a very long time. But we don't because the time for that has passed. I think we have maybe another 18 months, we have maybe a couple more projects that need to play out. But I think the community has had enough. They would like to see results. They would like to see systems that work. They would like to not see this carrot dangled in front of them forever. So I'm super excited about the things that other people are doing on top of us. And let me give you a spattering of, of ideas. So uh, SocialFi is emerging on top of Avalanche. I'm really excited about what's happening there. Uh, people are building applications, social applications, where tokens are created organically. And uh, it's not like uh, you took Twitter and you sort of uh, retrofitted new tokens into it. It's just part of the interaction. You don't realize you're touching tokens. Uh, you're trying to slip into someone's DM, so to speak. And in the process, you're buying and selling tokens. And it's a very it's a fascinating setup that they have. Um, another thing that's happening uh, on top of Avalanche are the, uh, the emergence of secure trading platforms. We've all heard of FTX. I'm sure, and, um, and so we don't want to repeat that. We don't want to have a, 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 an exchange where the operator can misbehave. We also don't want an exchange uh, where MEV bots can come and misbehave. And we have never seen, and Wall Street has not seen, an exchange that provides full confidentiality. Those are now possible today. Mm -hmm. Enclave is based on top of Avalanche. It's, uh, it's, check it out if you haven't checked it out. And then third and final thing, of course, uh, in that space, is, uh, is uh, I'm doing a fun project called Coin Operated Agents. Uh, we're putting LLMs into every single validator so that you can interact with your chain using uh, regular human languages. So you can say, hey, I want to play a chess game. And you don't have to define the movement of the pieces. You don't have to write solidity code. It already knows chess. It's already studied everything. There is the study that mankind has put in digital form. Uh, or you can say, uh, you know, this, this transaction defines a lending platform. And you describe how Aave works. And you can say, if there's a dispute, uh, settle it fairly. Now, this is both, I think, one of the one of the most exciting ideas that we've explored. It's also one of the dumbest ideas I've ever touched. Um, <laughs> and it's very dangerous. I realize that all sorts of red flags are going up uh, in people's minds. Uh, yes, uh, this thing is prone to uh, hallucinations. It can steal your money. <laughs> Maybe it'll stash all the coins uh, aside and use them during the robot uprising. There are all sorts of issues there as well. <laughs> but it's fun, and somebody needs to explore this, and that's one, one of the things that's happening on Avalanche. That's great. Well, the next subject I want to explore is, you know, Ultimately, I think one of the greatest superpowers of an L1 is the ability to be jurisdiction agnostic, mm -hmm. right? I've often explained to people Satoshi's real innovation was to separate the protocol from the application layer when it came to compliance. And so you could have a global neutral protocol and everybody could build compliance at the application layer. So um, I'm curious about how you, you know, sort of see what you're building and, you know, how things are evolving uh, around the world, right? We've had a lot of changes the last couple of years on the regulatory front. And I, I don't want to spend too much time on regulation. I'd much rather talk about what you just covered, which is if you want to solve the FTX problem, you have it all on chain, right? And so where do you think that uh, differentiator between what's on chain, what's on protocol, and what's at the application layer and where to sort of draw that line in order for people to build the most jurisdiction agnostic application. So let's start with you. Okay, well, so I have a unique take on this and, uh, and I'll see how, how this audience reacts to it. So um, what happened with first and second generation coins, single chain to rule the entire world, is that and there's a single chain, and they, has, they have to be jurisdiction agnostic. They can't specialize. They can't support any single jurisdiction. There's just Bitcoin and its rules. And that attracts a certain kind of person 
including myself, uh, but it does, it, 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 it attracts a certain kind of person. And it brings with it a mentality that says, down with states, down with nation states, down with laws, down with everything, and we will build a new entire world. And that has made it very difficult for us to integrate with TradFi. Because Avalanche supports multiple chains, it allows those chains to become specialized to different jurisdictions. You can build compliance in at the chain layer, Mm. So you can have one of the things we're exploring uh, with JPM, Apollo, and others is an institutional chain for Wall Street, American-based, subject to U.S. rules. At the same time, there can be another chain, and there is, uh, based on Korean rules. At the same time, any one of you can start a chain based on Swiss rules, for example. And that's our take, and that's how these new multi-chain systems can be specialized and support uh, multiple jurisdictions and multiple legal systems at the same time. I think that's, an explore, that's something to be explored, and it brings with it a different mentality. You don't see the avalanche folks saying, down with you know, the United States dollar. We're not going to replace the dollar. We're here to integrate into existing systems. We do have the C chain. It's exactly like Ethereum. It's exactly like Bitcoin. But in addition to that, we have all these other chains that can uh, integrate into existing systems. Interesting. Where are we headed? <clears throat> yeah, so, you know, Maybe I'll, I'll start with, so if you look at some of the applications that are running on Canton right now, is yeah. we have over a trillion dollars of assets that have already been tokenized. Mm -hmm. The likes of US leveraged loans, US mortgages, yeah. US life insurance, repo, process over $100 billion a day of repo transactions. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are asking, how is that possible? Because a good chunk of that uh, uh, is being done in the US. And right. everybody thinks the US is really anti this technology. And I think that when, you, when we started building Canton over six years ago, we really started thinking about, again, a lot of regulators like to talk about principle-based regulation, right. meaning these principles, IOSCO principles, for example, are international. Pretty much most developed countries follow these rules. The Basel Committee, right, the capital charges, most developed countries follow these rules. You have GDPR, you have data domicile rules. Yep. So, so we started thinking about, and, and that's again back to my earlier comment, was we can't have a chain enforcing the rules because the rules all over the world are very different in, the, in different countries. Right. And therefore, if you can actually allow the smart contract to define the rules, we can actually show that you can comply with all of these regulations. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times where our clients that they don't launch these type of products without going to the regulators. They come to the regulator and we, they say, I understand here are the things that you're concerned about and I can demonstrate to you that I'm following all of these regulations. And that's why in most of our, in most, in most cases, most of our clients have received the regulatory approval and they're in production for now, in some cases, multiple years. Interesting. Lemon? Yeah, so yeah, I like the distinction that you made at the beginning that the chain itself is not for a particular jurisdiction because it's global. Right. It's, it's decentralized. And you mentioned FTX. The problem with FTX was not a failure of decentralization. It was a failure of centralization. Right. <laughs> the solution is to not do that, to make it decentralized, put it on a, on a chain. But then what you want to be able to do is do jurisdiction things above that. And so that's what we do. Of course, with a smart contract, you can put in any rules that you want. But we also have native tokens. We've allowed them also to be customized. When you create your token, you can put rules in for KYC or whatever you want. You can make it so that only certain people can use it or that you have to do certain things to get the ability to use it. Or you can make it totally open. It's, it's the ability to make it whatever is compliant with the regulators you care about. Right. And I think this is important. You need the chain itself to be agnostic but then you need to have the power to enable people to create applications on top of it, smart contracts or the tokens themselves uh, in ways that are uh, compliant. Mm. And we have uh, this also, the Air Consensus Service allows you to sort of have a notary public storing information, recording information, timestamping it. It can, be it can be encrypted or it can be a hash. And there again, you can do things that are appropriate for your jurisdiction. Right. And we give all sorts of mechanisms for that you control it the way you want to. And I think this is absolutely the future. Uh, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't be forcing things at the ledger layer itself, the blockchain layer itself. But you should be empowering those who build on top of it to enforce whatever they want to enforce. Right. That's the future. Yeah. John? Yeah, so I think a lot has been said there <clears throat> that uh, I agree with. Uh, I think Lehman is correct. Um, 
the, these blockchains, they're just ones and zeros. Uh, it's just data. It's a, it's a distributed database. Um, you've got a consensus mechanism that's keeping it, keeping it all in parity. Um, and there's nothing, I don't think, I mean, I'm not, I'm not obviously on the compliance or legal side of the business, but there's nothing opinionated about that from a, a regulatory standpoint. I think I would also agree with Lehman that when you have a Turing complete smart contract layer and you can express your intent within, within that, that contract, it's, it's at the application layer or the smart contract layer that you have to uh, ensure compliance with you know, the jurisdiction that you're operating in. And I think, furthermore, these tokens, they're abstractions, of course. Uh, they're, 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 as we've seen yesterday on, 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 the first, on the very first panel, um, an ERC-20 token is essentially a dictionary sitting inside. It's, it's, it's a ledger in a ledger, right? And so there's nothing... Um, I don't think uh, it, it's about the legal binding of that in the real world, and so that's where I would I, I would think that uh, we should we should focus um, our efforts to be jurisdictionally compliant. Got it. Well, we've covered a, <clears throat> a lot of territory that goes towards you know sort of how do we achieve that mass adoption, and you know John maybe you can kick us off on this one, but you know what is that you know key efficiency gain or interface or thing that sort of gets us to a billion users in crypto. I think last I saw we're at 400 million web wallets or something like that, depending on how you define a web wallet and a user. Um, but, you know, we're certainly getting there. You know, people, you know, kind of lose track during the, the bear market, but it's continued to grow very aggressively uh, as far as uh, user base. So how do we get to that, that billionth user? Yeah, I mean, maybe we don't. But um, what I would say, I've spent a lot of time building applications, um, software applications at, at an enterprise level. And what I see with blockchain is it's an ingredient that, that, that can be used in certain applications. And when you use this ingredient, a bit like chili or garlic, it adds a flavor to your app. Um, and so what blockchain, of course, brings is um, disintermediation, self-sovereignty, uh, you know, uh, the ability to, to, to build an application where you, 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 you don't have, have to trust anyone. And so, but not every app needs that. Right. There are certain classes of enterprise-grade app and certain classes of financial app that having that ingredient uh, makes the dish sing. Um, I don't know whether or not we need to have you know, billions of users on blockchain. I think it's, it's just another amazing tool in, in the suite of software engineering um, that will create certain applications that will be very impactful for people's lives. Um, but I'm not so sure that we need everyone to be walking around with a Web3 wallet in, in, in their pocket. Amen. Uh, so, not everything should be done on the blockchain. This is absolutely true. <laughs> and, and not everything should be done on the internet. But just as the internet has become part of all of finance, all of business, all of education, all of society, I think we're going to see the same thing happening with blockchain. I think that our industry is going to become part of everything. It isn't the solution to every problem, but every big system will have a component that is this. For the same reason that not all data is stored in databases, we still store data on paper, but most data has actually migrated to databases because it gives you efficiency and it gives you advantages. We're going to see the same thing here. Most things of value in the real world will be a token because that allows you to trade it more easily with lower friction. You can disintermediate trusted third parties to be a middleman. Right. There is a lot of ways in which it just makes sense. And just as the data of the world moved to databases, not all of it, but, but a lot of it, most of it, because it just was better, I think we're going to see the same thing happening with ledgers, is that it just makes sense to not have to trust any single individual, to be able to interact with a stranger and have enforced rules and to be able to have things of value that can be transferred extremely fast and extremely cheaply. Yeah. So if you can send it for a tenth of a cent, of a, of, you know, a thousandth of a US dollar, and you can send millions of dollars to someone for a thousandth of a US dollar, that just makes sense. Yeah. Today, if I send a wire in this world where the internet can get a message around the planet in a fraction of a second, why does it take me days to send a wire? And I have to pay $20 for it. And even in a world, in a country that doesn't use dollars, you might have to pay in dollars. The whole thing is crazy. So I think that what we are going to see is the whole world is going to move to ledgers, not for everything, nothing solves all problems, but for significant pieces of, of everything, we'll be using ledgers for at least part of what it's doing, including just casual games and other things, because it brings trust. It, in games, it lets you move your assets from one game to another. You know, you spend all this time earning a magic gun or sword or something in your game, and you want to move it to another one, or a, a suit for your avatar. Right. 
it just makes sense. And so I think we're going to see this, and I think that people are starting to realize this now in the world outside of our community. All right. so, so how many billions of users are inevitable? That's the yeah, <laughs> I actually think that the question needs to be impact a billion. And I, and, I, and I kind of agree with the comments before because I, I, I don't necessarily, there are going to be B2C applications and that's where you're going to see the actual direct touch. But at the end of the day, I think that the, the big potential is that it is going to impact not just one billion, but billions. And if you take the example of um, Robinhood, which introduced fractionalization of shares, right. They didn't touch blockchain, they didn't do tokenization. It's just US equities became such an efficient asset class that trading a half a share had no marginal cost compared to 100 shares. And I think that that's the big opportunity, kind of what Lehman just said, is <clears throat> there are so many asset classes out there today that are still so inefficient. Like for example, alternative investments. The marginal cost of trading an alternative investment is still very expensive. And that's why becoming an LP in a private equity, you usually have to put $50 million. And, 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 and there are people that are trying to democratize it, but it's still pretty expensive. So I actually think you can pretty much think of every asset class in the world outside of US equities, that there are significant efficiencies using this technology. And once these things are implemented, then the impact will be on billions of users. That's great. Yeah, let me very quickly uh, tag on to what my fellow panelists so eloquently put. Um, so I want to just focus on, I agree with everything they said. Um, I want to just focus on the things that are keeping us from reaching that billion today. <coughs> and there are a couple of things that we need to do as a community. Number one, uh, interacting with chains has to be much, much, much simpler. Uh, we all started from a geeky background. We love those hexadecimal numbers. We love our seed <laughs> phrases, etc., etc. None of that makes sense to a normal person, and they all have to go away. So um, the core wallet, for example, for Avalanche is supposed to be your interaction uh, platform for multiple chains, and uh, it tries to hide a bunch of this. Uh, but there's still a lot of uh, distance to cover. The second thing that needs to happen is it needs to be a lot easier to take valuable things you have in, on your balance sheet, wherever you've got them, and uh, convert them into digital tokens. And so one of the things we're doing is, of course, this thing called AvaCloud that allows people to spin up an entire chain uh, in a matter of minutes if they so choose. And then the third and final thing is on the developer side. Um, I think Solidity is great, but writing some Solidity code, getting it audited, et cetera, is just, just too, too hard. Even your regular, actually properly educated CS people will find it difficult to turn into, uh, into, uh, into uh, blockchain programmers to, to, to write trustworthy code. Uh, I think one of the things that we're doing with this coin-operated uh, agent effort is to try to bring AI techniques so that some of that specification can be done using natural languages. Some of the human interaction can be done using languages that normal people can understand. So if someone can write a check that says, this is my donation to this charity, uh, to, you know, let's say, my friend's uh, effort to uh, make a movie, and it's my $500 for the cause, on, if and only if, uh, he can raise $5 million. Otherwise, I want my money back. And then the chain should just execute this in the same manner that a trustworthy lawyer or, or trustee would execute uh, a set of instructions uh, free of conflicts of interest. So that, those kinds are the kinds of techniques that I think are going to allow us to, uh, to reach the next billion. Well, um, we only have time for one more question, and I do kind of want to uh, tee it up for the next panel. Um, because I have the pleasure of hosting our friends from Layer 2s uh, on the next discussion. Um, and so I'm curious, you know, where you guys see, you know, the role of Layer 2s. Um, you know, do you encourage them in, in your context? You know, um, a lot of them have emerged on Ethereum and other uh, systems, but it's been a big trend the last few years. So why don't you kick us off real quick? And we've only got about 30 seconds each. 30 seconds, okay, very qu quickly. Layer twos are what happens when you run out of ideas on how to scale your algorithm. <laughs> that's, that's just sadly true. Cool. There is no such thing as a layer two. There are just chains and there are bridges. So those bridges can be less trust, uh, trusted and more or more trusted, depending on the flavor. Today's layer twos are all highly trusted, typically, uh, maybe not all of them. Most of them are, you use bridges that are highly uh, re requiring trust. So. 
We, we encourage layer twos on top of Avalanche, but that's not the way. They, they divide liquidity, they give out a very fractured user experience. The right vision here is to provide a big umbrella that makes all interactions with multiple chains seamless and easy. And layer twos today, as I see them, are essentially social place to, uh, to ally oneself with an existing large community uh, to sort of you know, seem harmless to that community while carving out and cannibalizing applications on that community. Well, thank you for spicing it up. <laughs> yeah, listen, I think, I think layer twos were a, a good solution when some of the early smart contract chain Ethereum yeah. did not think about some of the scaling mechanisms from day one. Mm. And solving that architecture problem after the fact is a big challenge. And then right. came people like Amin and others that just said you could actually solve that within the layer one. Mm. So at the end of the day, I, I think that layers two did a good job to solve a specific problem that existed at the point of time. But I think that layer ones going forward do not need to face those type of challenges. Yeah. And I agree. I think that layer two started as just a way to make up for the flaws in the layer one. So fix the layer one is a better solution. But in the, in the future though, I don't think they did go away. I think they evolved to become in a sense, other layer ones that bridge to other layer ones. Yeah. They become peers. And uh, I, I would see that as the future. So they stop, maybe you stop calling them layer twos um, because maybe we don't have to make up for all the flaws in layer ones anymore. Okay, John? <laughs> don't listen to these guys. <laughs> <laughs> layer twos are great. Um, I have maybe a slightly more nuanced view in the sense that I agree that uh, layer twos for scaling may be not so hot anymore when layer ones are so great um, at scaling. Um, but layer twos for uh, maybe execution of bytecode from a different chain, layer twos for privacy, for execution of contracts where you write the committal back to the, to the main chain, that type of thing. Uh, layer twos for specific applications, I think, could be cool. Very cool. Well, everybody stay on stage. We do have uh, one special thing to do today. Uh, one of my favorite things about CFC is the amazing curation of the people here often leads to partnerships and alliances and things like that. And so without any further ado, uh, John and, and Lehman, I believe you guys have something to announce uh, with something you guys have been working on. I think we do. Uh, so we have talked about what we really need is for everything in our world to be easy for the rest of the world that are not blockchain people. Right now, if you lose your keys, you lose everything. And <laughs> I get emails from people that say, hey, I lost my 24 words. Would you mind uh, generating new ones for me? Yeah. Uh, no, I <laughs> can't do that. So what we need is a way that you can trust it. We don't really want to give everything to a custody. If it's not your key, it's not your crypto. What we really want is to be able to have it to be easy to, to recover your information. And I'm just, I said keys, but this is also your passwords. This is also the combo to your safe or your, your secret recipe for cookies. Whatever your, your secrets are, you need to be able to recover them without giving them to a custody provider. We need to do it in a decentralized way. Decentralized recovery, just like decentralized finance is DeFi, decentralized recovery is DREC. And what we need is for all of us to be working together. And so the first two ecosystems that are, that are announcing today, but we want to bring in other ecosystems as well, is Algorand and Hedera. Hedera. <laughs> would well, you like to say something about it? Yeah, you know, um, joining forces with Hedera on this was an easy decision to make. Lehman's team, uh, so we're a, we're a, uh, Algorand as an ecosystem is a, is a founding a member of the DREC Alliance. But we want to bring in everyone, uh, AVAX, uh, Cardano, yeah. maybe not Solana, because I don't like them so much. <laughs> but we, 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 want, we, want to bring, we want to bring in everyone. I'm, I'm teasing, I'm teasing. Um, and the coolest thing about, about this protocol uh, that Lehman's team have engineered is that it's not biased, it's not partisan. It doesn't leverage specific nuances of any particular chain. It uses regular uh, cryptography, RSA, ECC, normal things. Um, and that's the best bit. So it's not using anyone's particular state proof or anyone's you know, proprietary implementation. It's completely open source, it's completely open for contribution, and uh, it's, it's not biased. And hopefully, by doing this and having a mechanism for decentralized recovery of keys, we will not only help people, but I think we're gonna see an influx of people joining uh, the limited number of spots in the Alliance uh, because it's not tribal. Absolutely. 
<laughs> I was told to wear this today. Normally, I don't wear this. I was told that. Go ahead, Lemon. Uh, no, so we, we really do want everyone, and we have a lot of people that are now joining. Uh, we have banks and credit unions and wallet providers. So the idea is that if you have a secret, such as a key for a ledger, but it could be for anything, that you find friends and family, or you find banks that you trust, or lawyers that you trust, people doing this as a service, and you break it up among them using very traditional tri cryptography, very, very straightforward things. You give each of them a piece. One piece doesn't tell them anything, but if half of them get together, they can help you recover if you lose your secret. What are the important things here? It doesn't have to touch any ledgers. This is not a smart contract. This is not on any blockchain. It's just purely on, say, your phone talking to your helper's phones. Or maybe your helper has a server, and it's your phone talking to their server. And it checks every day, do you still have the piece of my secret that I gave you? automatically. You've got to do that. If you break this up your secret and give pieces to all your friends, I guarantee you, if you don't have your phone checking every day, do you still have my piece? Eventually they will lose it and you won't know it until everyone's lost it. And then when you need to recover, you can't recover. So it's got to be doing that. And it has to keep secret who your helpers are, or even how many helpers you have. That's very, very important. So it's just some very simple protocols for how do you connect to a helper? How do you give them a secret? How do you update the secret? How do you uh, recover it from them? And how do you check automatically every night? Very simple protocols for what the bytes are over the internet. It can go directly from your phone to the server, or from a phone to a phone or whatever, or from server to server. It does not have to touch any blockchain. This is actually bigger than the blockchain industry, but we want to start with the blockchain industry because we desperately need it. Users need a safety net. In all of your life, you have a safety net. If you lose the password to your bank, you will eventually be able to get into your bank account. And in our world of blockchain, there's no safety net. Mm -hmm. So we desperately need this. So it's all open source, and everyone can join this alliance and have a hand in designing the protocol, in implementing it. Uh, we're building libraries to give away for free, so it's very easy to implement into your software. That sounds well. exciting, and I yeah, can't wait for the rest of the yeah. team to discuss this in the bubbles, in the break. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Great discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Thanks.